Hello, uh, my name is Forbes Walker. I'm the Environmental Soil Specialist here at the University of Tennessee Extension. And uh, today I'd like to talk to you about soil management practices that uh, help improve soil health. On this presentation today, I've got my colleague, uh, Dr. Neil Aish as well. Um, this is the last of our four talks on our soil health tour. And I hope you found these talks useful. Definition of the soil health. This is, uh, we'll continue to use the USDA definition that uh, uh, describes soil health as the continued capacity of a soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. So when we look at the uh, soil as an ecosystem, uh, the thing that is, uh, is, is critical in this ecosystem is the, uh, is the microbes that live there. And they all need food, shelter, and water. And uh, Dr. De Bruyne has already explained some of the basics behind uh, microbial activity to you in her talk. Um, organic matter or carbon is critical for soil microbes to perform their functions. Without soil carbon, the uh, microbes really don't function. And uh, so what we're looking at are practices that improve uh, or conserve soil carbon uh, will help build and improve soil health. So it's the carbon uh, that is important. So let's look at some of the, uh, the, the things that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, methods of reducing, uh, of improving soil health through reduced tillage through the adoption of no-till. Uh, we're obviously here at the uh, Milan no-till virtual field day this year. We've been doing no-till at Milan since 1981, so we've got quite a bit of experience. We are learning there are some other practices in addition to just no-till that we can do to uh, help build soil resilience. Uh, including cover uh, crop rotation, the use of cover crops, and diversifying both the cover crops and the crop rotations. Um, in addition to improving soil health, nutrient management and water management is very important. Uh, we'll just be touching on those briefly. Some of these are covered quite well in other tours at the, on, this, on this particular uh, field day. So if we can reduce tillage and adopt no-till, we can do some great things in re reducing the, the destruction of organic matter in our, our soil. Basically what happens when, organic, when, when the soil is tilled, we're going to aerate that soil. The stimulation, the oxygen aerating the soil is actually going to stimulate the microbes to break down that organic matter and release it into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. Organic matter is important for many, many reasons. Uh, it's very important in nutrient cycling and uh, it holds a pool of nutrients in, in, the, uh, in the organic matter. So if we lose that organic matter, we lose a pool of nutrients. Organic matter is also very, very important in water dynamics, um, helping with uh, infiltration, uh, re you know, reducing evaporation and increasing the water holding capacity. A part of that is all related to the structure. If we're pulverizing our soil through tillage, uh, the soil doesn't have much of a, a structure. Uh, we're going to uh, you know, um, have more crusting in, in tilled systems than in no-till systems. Uh, with, uh, with improvements in structure, we get improvements in water management, we get improvements in, in root development, better aggregation, and it's also going to prevent erosion. Now I'm going to, um, the only thing you turn your hurl to make me a recommendation on tillage is uh, we say that tillage should only be performed when soil moisture is low enough to prevent compaction. So this has been a, an issue with people that are tilling especially in these wetter uh, springs that we've been having in, in recent years, and that, that can also cause problems. But, however, Tennessee is a no-till state. Uh, this is a summary of a, um, um, an analysis of the 2017 uh, US Census of Agriculture. This is reported by the Soil Health Institute. And uh, we've got a couple of figures here. One is to, to show that uh, uh, Tennessee is a, a leader with over 75% of the the, the state being um, no-till, I would uh, suggest that we're probably closer to 80, 85 percent than 75 percent. And we do have um, some way to go with the adoption of cover crops, with this particular report suggesting that we're only at about 10 to 15 percent. I like to use this example of uh, the revised universal soil loss equation. This is an equation that uh, the uh, United States uh, Department of Agriculture, the NRCS folks, use to estimate soil uh, erosion losses and uh, what we have here is a, 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 a Gibson a soil in Gibson County a Grenada soil on a two to six percent slope and if we were plowing this um, soil 
and growing corn, we would expect a uh, loss in terms of tons per acre per year of about 64 tons per acre under corn, 95 tons per acre under soy, and 100 tons of acre per year under cotton. Obviously, these types of soil losses are not sustainable. And uh, through the adoption of no-till, we can greatly reduce soil losses. So for corn, going from plowed to no-till, we reduce our losses from 64 tonnes to slightly under 2 tonnes, 1.4 tonnes. Uh, with the low residue systems under uh, soy and cotton, because we don't have much residue on the surface, our losses are fairly, still fairly significant. Soy uh, under no-till, 14 tonnes per acre per year, and cotton, 19 tonnes. Can we do better? Yes, we can do better. And if we add a cover crop into the system, we can uh, reduce our uh, soil erosion losses under corn to less than one ton per acre per year, less than four tons for soybeans and less than five tons for cotton. So this indicates that yes, no-till is a great way to reduce soil erosion, but also addition of cover crops is another great way of further reducing that soil erosion. So crop rotations and cover crops, what are they? We're, we're basically what we're talking about with crop rotations is we vary the crops species in time and space. So we're not always growing the same crop year after year after year. Uh, the use of uh, corn and followed by soy um, in uh, rotations is common in Tennessee. And what this does is it helps break down weed disease and pest cycles. The addition of cover crops into these systems, these crop rotations also further has, has got further benefits. One thing about cover crops, as we saw in that previous slide, is that surface, uh, uh, so much less erosion is going to take place uh, because we've got uh, something growing on the, on the soil most of the year. We know that we're going to slowly maintain or increase soil organic matter content. If we've got leguminous cover crops in the mix, we're going to supply some nitrogen to our, our, our plants. We know that there's some weed suppression will occur. But we know that we can scavenge nutrients and there are some people uh, in other parts of the state, especially in Middle Tennessee, have started to graze their cover crops uh, in, the, in the springtime and they're finding that makes the cover crops more profitable. But uh, that's just an aside there. So when we talk about cover crops for, for Tennessee, what are they? They are basically annuals that we're going to be planting uh, either in the, um, the, in the winter time or interceded into uh, summer uh, uh, things. But, uh, break them down into grasses or cereals and rye or cereal rye, oats, wheat, millet and sorghum are, um, are, are common things. Obviously the, the rye, oats and wheat are winter, the millet and the sorghum will be summer. Uh, for leguminous crops we've had lots of success with that with vetches, especially hairy vetch. Clovers, especially crimson clover, are our go-to cover crops, leguminous cover crops for winter. And then if we were to go to uh, summer uh, annual cover crops, cowpeas and lupins are things. And then I've thrown in some others in uh, as, as uh, um, buckwheat is, is a commonly used one, especially in organic systems. And then the use of brassicas, uh, radishes and turnips are, are becoming more and more common uh, for um, in different cover crop mixes. This is an example of some work we did in um, East Tennessee when we were growing um, organic no-till corn from a few years ago and if we, we look at the bottom left hand here we, we planted a, uh, a summer cover crop, a, a cow pea crop which we then followed with a winter cover crop and noticed that the great establishment and the great cover that we've got and then in the uh, spring we terminated the, uh, the covers by rolling them and then we planted directly into the uh, planting of the corn directly into the rolled um, cover crop and uh, some great, great uh, weed suppression and great, great uh, things. So this is what we're talking about in terms of building organic matter, conserving and improving carbon and uh, hopefully improving our soil health. Some of the uh, weed control benefits with cover crops is through uh, competition for nutrients and water. There's shading, uh, allelopathic effects with some things uh, have, have been reported and we're learning our, our, our um, Weed specialist Dr. Larry Steckel has uh, found some instances where we can actually reduce the need for some uh, early season herbicides and or even some late season herbicides and uh, that, uh, that will help cover defray the costs of the, uh, the, the cover crops. This is some uh, recent data that Amin Nouri did as part of his uh, PhD work. 
This is looking at a, uh, a long-term uh, continuous cotton experiment that we have in Jackson. It's a very, very busy slide, but what I want to emphasize here is going back to the early 80s, all the way through to the 2018, you can see the variation in the, in the crop yields. And what I want you to pay attention to is the no cover crop thing is the blue line. And you can see over time that blue line starts to dominate uh, in the lower yielding parts of the, uh, of, of the, of the years. Whereas the, uh, the, the reds and the, and, the, and, the, and the yellows and the greens float to the top. So this is a great data set to show that yes, cover crops, long term use of cover crops, the cover crop uh, plots, even in poor years, are going to start to outperform the no cover crop. So that's another reason for growing the cover crops. One of the reasons, and we've, this is some more unpublished data, this is a, a graduate student of mine, um, um, Safak Silan. Uh, he went to these long-term plots and uh, these plots were established back in 1981. And we find significant increases in uh, total organic carbon. You can see this graph on the top right hand under no-till, significantly more total organic carbon than, than conventional till. When you break it down into the cover crop systems, significantly more total organic carbon in the crimson clover and the hairy vetch compared with the no cover and the wheat. Uh, we also looked at the wet aggregate stability. That's a, 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 a measure of how the aggregates break down or don't break down under impact from water. And you can see that there was much higher wet aggregate stability in the crimson clover uh, uh, cover crop treatments compared with the wheat or the cover crop. And again, breaking down the wet aggregate stability but across all treatments, by um, no-till and, and conventional till, you can see significantly higher in the in the no-till. I'd also encourage you to to look at uh, Dr. Cindy Jagadama's talk in this tour, uh, where she's talking about some of these issues as well. Um, she's particularly talking about how some of the um, current um, um, popular soil health tests don't appear to be working for us very well in Tennessee. Uh, we've been working with a, another group of, a, this is a, a simple test called a microbiometer test. We've applied this to these same plots and we found with this rapid test that we were able to distinguish between the no-till and the till. Uh, this is a, a basically a measure of uh, microbial populations um, using this, this quick test and it appears to be doing us a good job. Uh, we also got a similar result to the, um, with, the with the cover crops, uh, similar to the uh, last couple of slides when I was talking about the wet, about the, the total organic carbon. And so looks like we're, we're, we maybe have found a test that may work, but um, we've still got a lot of work to do on it. And this is again, unpublished data that uh, Amin Nouri has been helping us out with. The uh, one uh, bit of yield data we do have from the benefits of cover crops is data that we've got from um, a, a rotational study, a, a corn, a soybean corn a rotational study in, in, um, in Milan. And uh, the one year we got a significant yield response was in a dry year. Uh, this first year, 2014, we had soybeans and we were inundated with slugs, so we didn't have any yield difference. The next year we had corn, 2015, there was no significant difference in the yield. The one year when we have detected a, a yield difference is the um, 2016 when we had soybeans, it was a dry year and we saw significant yield response using a five-way, six-way uh, species mix of cover crops. The last time we had the, uh, the mild no-till field day, we actually had a demonstration demonstrating this thing. I'll just, this is a picture I pulled from that particular thing. So we've got uh, soils from a vertical tillage plot, soils from a control, no cover crop uh, soils, uh, where we were using a, um, a cereal uh, rye, and then this one where we're using cereal rye and crimson clover. And the take home message here is the lower pots are showing how much runoff is. So you see significant runoff coming from the vertical tillage con con controls and almost no runoff coming from the, uh, um, the, um, the cover crop treatments. And we can see we measured the infiltration rate. So this is telling us this with, with no-till in combination with cover crops, we're doing some great things with, to our water management and improving our water management. Start to wind up this talk by talking a little bit about fertilizers and lime. Obviously, if we've got some nutrients that are deficient, we need to correct that. 
and uh, rather than guess how much fertilizer we need, we always recommend that we use a soil test to, uh, uh, to pull soil samples and using the University of, of Tennessee lab or a similar lab uh, run our soil tests. The other thing is it's very important to understand what your soil test is, is recommending. I will say that we, the University of Tennessee, always will recommend us have a sufficiency uh, approach to recommending nutrients. So we're only going to recommend nutrients that are going to give you, are going to be sufficient to give you a yield response. We're not going to suggest that you maintain high soil test values if, the, if you're not going to get a yield response. Correcting soil pH is a very, very important thing. That's, again, that's something that you get from the soil um, uh, test report. And uh, we think it's very, we know it's very important to use uh, state specific recommendations for our fertilizer rates. Following the four R's, which is a uh, series of principles that the Fertilize Institute is, is, uh, uh, is uh, promoting, the uh, right rate of fertilizer, uh, the right type of fertilizer at the right time, and the right placement of the four R's. Uh, we know that there are some precision egg um, technologies, particular variable rate applications of fertilizers, also are ways to better target our nutrient applications. Water management, this is being covered in our um, Tour I, uh, there was, uh, this could have easily been part of our, um, our, our, our tour here, and I would encourage you to go and look at the talks, specifically the ones that Brian Leib and Avat Shakufa are talking about. Brian is our irrigation specialist. He's got some neat work going on in how we manage our irrigation. Can we manage it more smartly rather than blanket irrigation actions? The use of sensors, and we also have a, he has an app developed a, that we can use with a, with a cell phone that should be being released soon. And uh, Avat Shakufa, plant physiologist, doing some really great work looking at how our high performing varieties perform under deficit conditions. Some of them do really well, some of them not so well. And so maybe in the future, when we're looking at improving uh, soil health, we also want to be looking at some of these varieties that not only yield well under ideal conditions, but yield well under variable rainfall conditions. And so I was gonna end this talk by giving the same demo definition slide that I started off with. So when we talk about soil health, we're talking about the capacity of the soil to function as a vital living ecosystem. Uh, when we talk about the soil as an ecosystem, it's an ecosystem for microbes that all need food, shelter, and water, and organic matter or carbon is critical for that. If we can, do pre if we can increase or maintain our carbon, then we can improve our soil health uh, uh, um, measures. And uh, practices that improve or console soil carbon are critical for building and improving soil health. And I will leave you with a slide um, from the last mile and no-till field day when we actually did it in person. And uh, hopefully we will uh, see you in, in person in two years' time, 2022. If you've got any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me. I've left you my email address. And again, thank you very much for your time.